Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret. Continuing our verse by verse study through the book of Proverbs, we come today to Proverbs chapter 7, I should say chapter 13, verse number 7. And we will begin there in just a minute. Just a reminder to you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com that you can study the Bible in its entirety, verse by verse, from Genesis through Revelation, study at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible commentaries. Three complete series going through the Bible, verse by verse. It's there for you at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Please pray for this ministry, would you, of getting out God's word. Well, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 13, Proverbs, verse 7. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Money is a barometer of our spiritual condition. Money is amoral. Having money is not sinful. I heard somebody misquote that again yesterday. Having money is sin. Being rich is sin. No, it isn't. Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not having money. It's the love of money. The Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money or wealth. You have to choose. Money is a very powerful idol in the world today because of all that it can buy. And people falsely put their put their trust in money and what it can buy. And it always fails when they're on their deathbed. You better trust in God and not in money. But money, money can be a fine servant, but it makes a horrible, a horrible master and an even worse God and again, we read here, there is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. And there is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Many people have a lot of money today, especially when you compare it to biblical days. Many people have great purchasing power, enough to buy vehicles, really nice vehicles, and homes, and go out to eat, and go on fancy vacations many vacations, many, many vacations, many expensive vacations. And you know what? If God blesses a person with money, that's fine. But why do you think he blesses people with money? I mean, I'm talking about an abundance of money, enough to do all these extravagant things regularly. Why do you think he gives them that much money so that they will do those things? The answer to that question is absolutely not. Well, I give 10% to my church, or I give 10% to this ministry that's, that's, uh, that I like. Well, you could give a lot more to the Lord. You're spending a whole lot more money on extravagant things than you are on the work of the Lord. And I'm not one who talks a lot about money. You know that. But when it comes up, I talk about it just like any other subject in the Bible. And I'm just saying. Jesus said, you can't serve God and money. God doesn't, God doesn't give us any gift. God, doesn't, God did not give me the gift of teaching so that I could say all sorts of pleasant things to win a great big following to myself or to become popular. He gave me the gift of teaching so that I would proclaim his word the good, the bad, the good news, the bad news, the warnings, the promises, so on and so forth. He gives us gifts, each one of us. And some people have the gift of making money and having money. That's a gift from God. But he gives that to be used in his service, not to be squandered on self. And I'm not saying there isn't a time for a vacation or recreation or anything. I'm not saying that. Of course, I'm just saying there are some who are way out of balance. And if you would check their checkbook, 
or their bank statement, you would see what's really important to them. The opportunities that God gave them and the opportunities that they squandered to support his work of getting out God's word. Some who are blessed financially are very spiritually poor. They don't, they don't have purchasing power to buy peace or to buy joy or the forgiveness of sins or life everlasting. They got a lot of purchasing power, but they're spiritually poor because they haven't even repented and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the sad scenario of one who spends their time and energy accumulating wealth, accumulating material wealth, but they ignore their need for the true riches of the Spirit. That's the sad scenario of even professing Christians who have all sorts of money and spend it doing extravagant things rather than using a good portion of that money to help get out the Word of God. I say it. Money is a barometer of where we are spiritually. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is also. How do you spend your money? How do you spend, in some cases, the great wealth that God has given you? Just saying, a spiritual checkup would be in order for all of us. Verse 8, the ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. Rich people are often threatened by those who want to take their money. I suppose it would be nice to be rich in some ways. I know what I would do. I guarantee you, I've been praying. I know what I would do. I pray for this all the time. Lord, raise up some people who you have blessed, really blessed, to know how to make money. Something that I've never been gifted at. That's just not my calling. That's not where my focus is. Nor is it on extravagant vacations. Nor is it on fancy vehicles. I drive a 2008 PT Cruiser. Okay? And uh, I'm not bragging. I'm not complaining. It's just the way it is. I'm not, I'm not focused on that kind of stuff. I'm focused on getting out the Word of God. But I have prayed recently that God would raise up people that He has gifted, that really love Him and love His Word. They love His Word. And they have been gifted to make money. I have been praying that God would raise people like that up to give to this ministry so that I could buy more airtime on more radio stations to get out more of the Word of God to more people. Because I know there are people out there who really love God and love His Word and have blessed, been blessed to make money. And, I, and if I had it, that's what I'd do. I'd buy airtime. More and more airtime to get out the Word of God to more people. I know that. So there would be some advantages to that, no question about it. But sometimes, you know, bad, or rich people are targeted by bad people. Wealth isn't always that it's everything that it's cut out to be in some cases. And it can be a, road, a slippery road to hell if you squander it on the wrong things. Verse 9, The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Light is a picture of the good life. The Bible says that the good life of the righteous person, and I'm talking, when I talk about the good life, I'm not talking about good life living extravagantly, of course. I'm talking about the good life as being a righteous life, a holy life. And the Bible teaches that the good life, morally good life of the righteous person is a living testimony. Being around a righteous person will bring joy to another righteous person. It's sort of like stepping into a big room with a lot of picture windows. It's just good to be around them. Man, it's just, it brightens your day, you know? It's refreshing. Verse 10. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Prideful people seldom or never admit that they are wrong because that takes the opposite of pride. 
that takes humility. God says, pride causes strife. It certainly does, doesn't it? Pride causes strife. Pride is present in every single quarrel. If there is an argument, you can bet that pride is there somewhere. God wants us to be open to advice from others. God wants us to admit when we are wrong. Failure to do those two things is a manifestation of pride and it will destroy a relationship every single time. And you can take that to the bank. Verse 11. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. The kind of wealth that is generated by hard work helps society in general because it produces a product or a service. Wealth that is dreamt that is generated by crime is no benefit to society at all. It's its consequences generally cost society. 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. When you're looking forward to something and it does not happen, it can be very discouraging. When those times hit me, those times of encouragement, I always try to remember what God says. And I think he does remind me of this when I become discouraged or tempted to become discouraged because hope is deferred. I remember what the Bible says. Jesus said, keep on praying, keep on asking, keep on knocking. Men ought always to pray and not give up. If you believe you're praying for a good thing, if you believe you're waiting on God for a good thing, don't quit praying about it. There are some things I have been praying for for years. And I just, I can't quit because I just know deep down in my heart that they are according to the word of God. I won't quit. And believe me, sometimes it does get discouraging. I wonder why, but you know, why it doesn't happen. But men are always to pray and not give up. So I just keep plugging away at prayer. I hope you do that. But when, you, when you're looking forward to something that is biblical, you know, that you just know in your heart is right and it doesn't happen, man, it can be discouraging. High expectations that do not come to pass can create hopelessness unless one focuses on the sovereignty of God and on the wisdom of God. Look at verse 12 again. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. In other words, when your desire at last does come to pass, there's going to be great happiness and great satisfaction. And often the former times of waiting and discouragement are forgotten because the joy is so wonderful. You finally got it, man. It's great. 13. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. But he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. The word of God contains the only answers for the problems of man because the problems of man are spiritual in nature. I'm talking about behavioral problems. They are spiritual in nature. Now they may sometimes manifest themselves in the physical realm, but their root problem is spiritual. Their root is sin. Problems come from not doing things God's way, and God's way is taught in Holy Scripture. That's where the problem comes. And that's why the only answer for the problems of mankind are found in the word of Almighty God. Verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me. The law of the wise is a fountain of life 
to depart from the snares of death. The wise that are referred to in this verse refers to those who believe the Word of God and who live by the Word of God. God has made a law. God has made a law which has ordained that the Word of God be the way of blessing. It is built right into creation. When our behavior does not line up with Scripture, then our behavior becomes a snare of death. In other words, it leads to nothing but trouble. This is an inescapable law that cannot be violated with impunity. Verse 15, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. If, if you want a hard life, then go against the Bible and you will have plenty of trouble. And that's just in this life. Wait till you hit eternity. The world is filled with immature people. So when someone who lives by Scripture and therefore shows good sense comes along, they are appreciated. At least they are appreciated by those who have some sense. Verse 16, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. God says that a fool, and again, a fool would be anyone who ignores the Word of God, who has no respect for the Word of God, or the Lord Jesus Christ, or God Almighty. That's a fool. And God says that a fool lays open his folly, meaning this, conduct reveals character. Conduct reveals character. Sometimes people say, oh, so-and-so, and I've talked about this just recently. You probably heard people say this. Sometimes people say, oh, so-and-so can really be a jerk. I mean, really be a bad person. But that's just the way he is. He's not a bad person. That's just the way he is. They say that as if that's just the way he is, is an excuse, a legitimate excuse. It's no excuse. It is no excuse because it's just the way he is? What is that? <laughs> Think about that. It makes no sense. How a person, let's look at what the Bible says, okay? Can we just stick to what the Word of God says? And then we get rid of all this foolish talk and all this foolish reasoning that leads to trouble. How a person acts reveals the kind of person that they really are. If you tell a lie, you are a liar. Well, I'm not a liar. Have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah. You tell lies sometimes now? Well, yeah, kind of. You're a liar. You are a liar. That's what a liar does. He tells lies, okay? So if you tell lies, you're a liar. If you do immoral things, you are immoral. If you steal things, you are a thief. It doesn't take a genius to figure that out. It just takes some honesty. That's just the way you are. Yeah, that's right. That's just the way you are. And that's exactly what you are. Which is why you need to repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior because the Bible says that liars, immoral person, thieves, etc., etc., will all have their place in the lake of fire. You think you're going to die after living a life like that? Having committed those sins? And maybe not every day, but with some of you it is every day. But maybe not every day, maybe just occasionally. But still, you're still a liar, you're still a thief, you're still immoral. You think you're going to die and stand before God and have him look at your life and hear him say, well, you did all these things, you lied, you steal, you stole, you uh, committed adultery, you lusted after pornography, you are guilty of fornication, 
Uh, you are guilty of immorality. You are guilty of homosexual acts. You are guilty of lesbian acts. You are guilty of all these things that my word condemns. But that's just the way you are. That's just the way you are. Don't worry about it. You come into heaven and you do the same thing there. Not in your life. He is not. You're not going to hear him say. You're going to hear him say, depart from me into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what you're going to hear. See, how do you know that, Brett? Because Jesus said it. I just quoted Jesus. And a lot of those people go to church. You think that's going to matter on Judgment Day? Not one bit. Not one bit. 17. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. An ambassador or a messenger is a representative. If you ask someone to be your representative or your spokesperson, then it is wise to make sure that they will act and speak the way you would act and speak. Because if they don't, then you are going to be misrepresented by your messenger, by your representative. You don't want to be misrepresented by your representative. So you've got to make sure that they think like you do. If they don't conduct themselves well, that reflects badly on you. And the Bible says that Christians are ambassadors for Christ. And Jesus said, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Come out from among them, the Bible says, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Why? Because we are Christ's representatives, and he touched not the unclean thing. Did he spend time with sinners? Yes. Did he make them feel comfortable in their sin? Absolutely not. He called them to repentance. He made them make a choice to either follow him or rebel against him. And if they rebelled against him, they walked away and he let them go. But he didn't leave them in the same condition that he found them. He at least brought them to a point where they had to make a decision based on the word of God based on whether they're going to repent or not. Too often today, modern Christians, even so-called Bible-believing Christians, are making sinners feel uncomfortable, or making sinners feel comfortable. And they don't preach against sin. And they don't talk about repentance. And they don't talk about hell because they don't want them to be uncomfortable because they want them to keep coming back to their church. That's not what Jesus did. And people say, oh, we have to be loving like Jesus. That's not how Jesus was. You are misrepresenting Jesus if you're that way. Your church is misrepresenting Jesus. That's not how he was. I'm so sick and tired of hearing modern evangelicals come against me for saying, you need to call sinners to repentance. You need to confront them as Jesus did. I'm not making this up, man. I'm just saying what Jesus said to do, okay? And what Jesus did and what John the Baptist did and what the prophets in the Bible did. Just do that, okay? You're just following the pattern set out by Jesus and the Word of God. Well, if we get them coming to our church, that's what I'm so sick of hearing. If we, if we don't confront them, you know, we get them coming to our church, then we'll change them. No, you won't. No, you won't. Because you never confront them. If you don't have the guts to confront them before they start coming to your church, before they are made comfortable in your services, before they start giving you money, you sure ain't going to have the guts to do it after they start doing those things. And that's the way it happens. And if you're honest, some of you who have experienced that, you know what I'm talking about. Aren't you sick of that? Aren't you sick of no one ever getting saved? Aren't you sick of the saved never really being challenged and growing in their faith? Aren't you sick of warmed over Psycho babble sermons that don't even call sin, sin? Aren't you sick of that? I'm telling you, it makes Jesus nauseous. I know it is. Because the Word of God commands young preachers, Timothy, Titus, the rest of us, whether we're young or not, preach the Word. Preach the Word. 
Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, that's negative. Rebuke, that's negative. Correct, that's negative. And also encourage and exhort. Positive, positive. But that door swings both ways. And if you're not doing it, you're not doing your job. Well, if we just get them coming, then we'll change them. You liar. You gutless wonder. You self-centered gutless hireling who look at the ministry as a career. You're not called. You may be called by your mom. You may be called by your dad. You may be called by somebody who said it was a pretty good career. You get to stand in front of people. You're not called by God because if you were, you wouldn't be able to shut up. You'd have to speak the truth like I'm doing and like others who are truly called by God. Christians are ambassadors of Christ. If we're not holy, if we don't speak the truth, my goodness, we reflect badly on Jesus. And I don't want, I don't want to stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ and have him tell me that I was a poor representative. And I know I got a long ways to go. I know that better than anybody, that I got a long ways to go. But I'm not locked into what is wrong. You know, I've gone along with the Apostle Paul, who knew he wasn't everything that he should be either, but he said he beat his body into subjection, lest after preaching to others, he himself would be a castaway. That's our attitude, not to condone sin, not to condone false doctrine, not to not rock the boat. That's not Paul. That's not Jesus. That's not John the Baptist. You say, yeah, they all had their heads chopped off. In Jesus' case, he was crucified. All the apostles were, were either crucified or persecuted and martyred too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's your choice, isn't it? Woe unto you, Jesus said, when all men speak well of you. That's the route you want to go. Go ahead. Have fun in the flames of hell forever. Because that's that goes along with that choice. You got to choose. Choose you this day who you will follow, Joshua said. Up to you. I'm just telling you ahead of time. The consequences of your choice and what we are supposed to do. Well, let's see. 18. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. So some of you people just heard the stuff maybe that I said and you, you're about to turn off the radio or the internet, whatever. You're never going to listen again. Okay. Well, look what God says. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Humility is the key to honor in God's eyes and to success as God defines it. If a person faithfully follows God's guidance from his word, they will also accept correction. And we all need correction and instruction from the people who know the scripture. And you can continue studying the word of God. I do want to say this. I want to encourage you, if you have any questions or comments for me, Email them to me, would you? At scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com. That's scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com. Because I love Bible questions, and I will begin to make, I've done this in the past, programs of question and answers from your questions. Or maybe I'll, I'll answer one or two, try to, before these broadcasts. I'll see how the Lord leads. But if you have any questions or comments, make sure you send them to me at scriptureversebyverse at gmail.com and continue studying the Word of God with me using my audio Bible messages at your pace, at your convenience at thebibleversebyverse.com That's thebibleversebyverse.com Please remember, this ministry is brought to you by your prayers and financial support and that's it. Never been underwritten by a large church or denomination so please consider being a part of this ministry with your prayers and click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com 
and prayerfully become a part of this ministry with your contributions as well. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. So long, everyone.